is a uh, has had a long interest in skepticism and free thinking. Uh, he had a career in technology in the technology industries and is now semi-retired, which means he's still working. Congratulations. Uh, he's, I've seen him, but were you here last year? Yes. Yeah, you were here last year. So ladies and gentlemen, for the second time in a row, let's hear it for Fred Moulton. shows the uh, 20th century philosopher of science, a liberal in the original classical uh, sense of that term, and a strong advocate of pluralism, free expression, and open society. He began his career in uh, Vienna, Austria, had to leave because of the Nazis. He left Europe, went to New Zealand for a few years, and then to London uh, for a position as professor of philosophy in the London School of Economics. Popper looks at me and asks, are you a scientist? Cautiously, I start to reply, well, not my profession or advanced study. However, I think most everybody is to a certain extent sometimes, and sort of, and you know, part, it's part of being human. And before I can quite finish, Popper continues, continues, well, yes, of course. I'm here to discuss uh, falsifiability as it applies to scientific theories. The essence of falsifiability is that you want to find ways to show your theory is false. So if you want your theory to have greater credence, then it helps to consider falsifiability. As you create the theory, too often people examining the theories fall into the justificationist trap. That is the trap of focusing only on data which justifies your theory. Perhaps you've heard of confirmation bias. It is all too easy to find supporting evidence for a theory and miss the evidence that punches a hole in your pet theory. Therefore, you need to specify what would be needed to actively test for falsifying results and then perform those tests and analyze the results if it means shattering a theory to which one has a deep <coughs> emotional attachment. This emphasis on falsifiability is part of the critical rationalism approach. Critical rationalism is a good tool for avoiding error. And falsifiability is useful in separating science and pseudoscience. Popper paused, and we all enjoyed a couple of sips of wine. Mm -hmm. The wine card. Ben Bartley uh, shifted in his chair, cleared his throat, and began to speak. I quickly blinked on his name, and the display showed Dr. Flossie from London School of Economics. Popper was his PhD advisor. 
dissertation revised and published as a book titled The Retreat to Commitment. Professor at several universities, including California State University in Hayward, and was named the outstanding professor of the entire California State University system in 1979. Later research fellow at Hoover Institute and editor of part of the collected works of F.A. Hayek. Martin glanced at Popper, then at me, and said, Professor, Professor Popper has done great work in developing his theories in science and falsifiability and critical rationalism. I decided to apply the idea of critical rationalism more broadly. My goal is to use the concept to investigate what is generally called the long-running conflict between science and religion. I took a deep breath, shifted nervously, and then said, that sounds like a huge topic. This bar closes at midnight. Can you finish that topic on that side before the bar closes? <laughs> Bartley nodded. We are fine concerning time. Do not worry. I will give you the abbreviated version. For the full version, you can read our published works. Bartley took another sip and continued. My observation, some adherents to religion, some adherents to science have a similar situation. Some, but not all, in each group do what I consider an intellectual retreat. Too often they commit to a position which they fail to specify how their position could be criticized. A religionist might say that their religion is a solid rock, a firm foundation, not subject to criticism. A proponent of science might make a similar bold claim about science. The point is that this can lead to two positions which are there, for which there is no ground for a meaningful philosophical dialogue. <clears throat> However, if both positions agree that everything is open to critical rationalism, then there's a common ground for dialogue. Barton smiled and continued, since one usage of the term pan is for including all I have repented to the phrase critical rationalism to form the phrase pan-critical rationalism. <clears throat> Thus we have a term, pan-critical rationalism, that applies the content, concept of critical rationalism and the attention to faults of viability and criticism considering any concept. I will note that some use the equivalent term comprehensively critical rationalism. When Bartley paused, I took a sip, I asked, uh, I think I'm beginning to see the theoretical value of this approach. However, could one of you perhaps give me a more concrete example? How would this work in the real world? Bartley and Popper looked at each other, and Popper said, Professor Bartley has more experience in California than I, so he should answer. Bartley nodded. Consider the Jehovah's Witness that occasionally are knocking on your door. Today, if you ask them what is the premier critical question and best potential test or falsification for their dogma, I suspect you will get at most a blank stare. <laughs> <laughs> but consider if the, if the idea of pan-critical rationalism was widespread, then they would at least be able to provide the critical questions and the falsifications tests for their dogma. Thus, there would be a lot more of a basis for discussion with them, I would hope. On the other hand, the entire Jehovah's Witness movement might end. Ideas tend to have consequences. Hold on a minute, I interjected. Let's consider this example for a moment. First is the question of what is being discussed. Usually the terms religion and faith are mostly intertwined. I tend to avoid using the term faith because there are two common usages that are often mixed in everyday language. The first usage of faith is the set of views that are considered absolutely true and never to be false. The second usage is sort of a synonym for confidence. An example of the first usage is my faith is a rock and shall not be moved. However, faith in the sense of confidence they seem to be used in situations where social convention makes it easier to say faith than to discuss simple things like uh, sample size and statistical considerations. Popper said, 
how do you think that critical rationalism fits with your ideas about faith? I felt like I was back in Bert, Professor Bertie T. Wilkins' philosophy class decades ago. I gathered my thoughts and said, well, if we consider sample size and there's some statistical concepts explicitly, then it facilitates weaving discussion of falsifiability of critical rationalism into conversation more generally by dropping the second meaning of faith and only using the, the term confidence, then <clears throat> more easily than we can, we can attempt to uh, deal with uh, issues of, of uh, someone that's attempting to slide some pseudoscience or woo past us. <clears throat> I pause for a moment and then continue. It seems to me that a per person would want their faith, excuse me, that a person would want their theory to fail as, as quickly as possible so that they would, could work on an approved theory. You know, if you get you have one theory wrong, you go on to your next improved theory. Sort of a fail as quickly as appropriate. F A Q A A. Popper and Markman laughed. I took another sip and said, as for the usage of the term faith as meaning dogma or ideology, I do not see how a person can come across the critical rationalism and can accept the critical falsifiability approach on one hand, and on the other hand, maintain a dogma which is immune from criticism. If fideism is the epistemological stance, that faith is independent of and superior to reason, then at the very least, they would need to carve out some aspect of the universe that is somehow special and then discard pan-critical rationalism and try to replace it with some other sort of mess that is difficult to name. This leads to all sorts of problems, such as the decision method for drawing this boundary. It seems to me that pan-critical rationalism might serve as an inoculation against this messy thinking. And if one continues to use pan-critical rationalism all day, every day, as much as possible, then one's cognitive health should improve since one has fewer unidentified false beliefs. Sort of like exercise and a good diet tends to lead to physical health. Because each day we encounter each new, new information, new theories, new situations. It's sort of like pancritical rationalism is a barrier against any sort of dogmatic faith, sort of a vaccine. I do not see how something like Jones Count could have happened if everyone involved had adopted a pancritical rationalist approach. Bartley nodded and we took another sip. I said, Jonestown occurred in 1978, a bit over 40 years ago. And didn't Crystal Pacht occur about four years before Jonestown? Popper replied, yes, in 1938. In 1937, I immigrated to New Zealand because living in Austria, I could see what was happening, that the future of Europe looked grim. I'd already published my work, The Logic of Scientific Discovery. My new position was as lecturer in philosophy at Canterbury University College at the University of New Zealand. The terrible events of Kristallnacht uh, occurred in November 1938. I was in New Zealand until 1946. I took the position in London. Bartley added, it was while Professor Popper was in New Zealand that wrote his really fine book, The Open Society and Its Enemies. I highly recommend it. You might want to read it and some of Professor Popper's other writings. Then you are primed to read my book, the retreat to commit. I said, well, that's more, there's even more books from my ever-expanding reading list. <laughs> even if I do not get them completely read this year, it is good to have to be familiar with the ideas. These ideas will serve as a good method to use when some very earnest person is attempting to swamp me with their favorite uh, conspiracy theory, such as chemtrails. <laughs> this falsifiability approach work as a sort of general purpose tool against cults, quacks, and mimetic parasites. 
Papa gave a sideways glance at Bartley and asked in a whisper, Trails? <laughs> Bartley <clears throat> seemed slightly embarrassed and muttered out the side of his mouth, I will explain later. <laughs> I pondered for a moment and said, well, since the word pan means everything, then pan-critical rationalism must apply to itself. Bartley smiled approvingly. I continued, some reflection leads me to conclude that I should adopt a bit of philosophical humility, even if I attempt to rigorously test and falsify my own ideas it is possible that I have missed something. Perhaps there is a <clears throat> criticism that I failed to consider, or I failed to go outside a test that, that an action falsified a uh, theory, but I misread the, the, and misunderstood the result. Wasn't it the physicist Richard Feynman who said that it is important not to fool yourself? This points to an area of improvement for the research and the investigation in how the field of psychology it relates to pan-critical rationalism. It might be that the key to many philosophical, it might not be that the key to every philosophical question is pan-critical rationalism, but it's a good tool for everybody's toolbox. We finished our wine, and as, I, and as we stood up, I, I, I kind of, well, it seems I could summarize pan-critical rationalism in an admittedly oversimplistic manner as question and doubt everything, which is short enough to fit on a license plate frame. <laughs> <laughs> so we exited the bar and all went our separate ways. But that is the end of the fictional story. Now to clean up a few things just in the interest of being accurate, I never met Karl Popper. Aww. I never met W.W. Barton. As far as I know, Karl Popper never visited Monterey. <laughs> <laughs> the Kim Trails conspiracy started up after both Popper and Bartley were dead. Uh, what is accurate and interesting is that Karl Popper and F.A. Hayek, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics, were friends. So Bartley, who was the student of Popper, was an editor of the, part of the collected works of, uh, of F.A. Hayek is interesting uh, uh, side note. And I will make uh, also point out that I mentioned Bernie T. Wilkins, who really was a professor of philosophy at the uh, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, and was the professor who gave me my first major introduction to uh, Karl Popper. And uh, I will give you one little small anecdote about the license plate frame. I've had that on many cards over the years, on and off. Many years ago, uh, I was running a book discussion group, and this is before Google Maps was a thing. One, we were meeting at a different, uh, someone's home, a new uh, location. One of the uh, people in the uh, group uh, came in and said, you know, I was a little unsure if I was on the right street or not, so I pulled in uh, to a car uh, and parked my car, and I looked up at the license plate frame of the car in front of me, and he said, and I knew I was in the right place. Because <laughs> we had, as a group, had all read Barclay's book, Retreat to Commitment, a few years prior. <laughs> so, thank you. We have time for a couple questions. Is there any questions? Or criticism. Oh, so you have know, criticism. Make sure you have criticism. Involved. I want to have some. I want to see this. Uh, I think you should have done the lecture with a couple of glasses of wine and a couple of people talking to you. <laughs> yeah, the, it, this, yes, we could have actually done this as a play. Jay, you got a question? All right. So, thank you very much, Fred.